Alice McKenzie was a study group partner while I was in seminary. And some years later, she preached a sermon at annual conference at Lakeside. And here's a story that she shared that stuck with me even till this day. She, she said, my friend Gary gave me permission to tell you this story and he's actually honored I did so. Gary is a computer analyst in his mid forties. He's been married and divorced twice. The most recent divorce occurring about three years ago. For about a year, he's been dating a wonderful woman at our church named Gina, who's also divorced with an adorable seven-year-old daughter. Gary and Gina came to me in February and asked if I would marry them and at, the, at the end of April. Our counseling and wedding prep planning we're going along fine until along about mid-March, Gary began to develop a case of very cold feet. When he shared this with Gina, she suggested that he get away for a day or so to clear his head. So Gary started driving with no particular destination. He ended up at a beautiful site near Lake Texoma, Texas. He got out of his car and began to walk to soothe his jangled nerves and to direct his thoughts towards God. He came to a bench that looks out over the lake and he sat down and tried to breathe more deeply and to unravel the knots in his stomach. And as he stared out at the lake, some things suddenly became clear as if he were looking into a soul mirror. He realized that there were actually three knots in his stomach, and each one had a name. One of the knots was his fear that he would just keep repeating the same relationship patterns. The second knot in his stomach was his fear of the challenge of blending two families. And the third knot in his stomach was maybe the hardest, the knottiest fear of all. It was the fear that maybe he was just not worthy of another person's love and was destined to have to face his future alone. Maybe the thing to do when we are starting out on a new venture or we're stuck in some kind of a rut or we're in a crisis kind of time like right now. Maybe the thing to do is to sit by ourselves somewhere and name the knots in our stomachs. What are your fears? It's a good thing to know their names because what we fear controls our lives. The book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord ought to control our lives. And I'll read from the first chapter in Proverbs. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, equity, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain learning and the discerning acquired skill. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Notice, there are a lot of fears that that verse doesn't mention. It doesn't assert that the fear of spiders is the beginning of knowledge. It doesn't say that the fear of heights is the beginning of wisdom, or that the fear of everyone finding out what you're really like is the beginning of wisdom, or on and on the fear of getting old being the beginning of wisdom. 
the fear of what other people think of you being the beginning of wisdom, no such comment. Every other fear we fight to get rid of, to become free from, the fear of the Lord we cultivate. Now I know it's a curious phrase, the fear of the Lord. When we hear or read those words, there's usually one of three responses. One is, is that our eyes glaze over. What does that mean? It doesn't compute. Or maybe our mind skips over it, discards it. Say, I don't, I don't think of God that way. Or that it makes us curious. I've heard this before. It sounds odd, but perhaps I need to explore that phrase. Perhaps I and many of us suffer fatigue from mounting fears, but the fear of the Lord delights the heart, says the psalmist, and gives gladness and joy. In the fear of the Lord, says the writer of Proverbs, one has strong confidence and one's children will have refuge. And that verse goes on, followed by these words, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life so that one may avoid the snares of death. The fear of others lays a snare, says the writer later, but one who trusts in the Lord rests secure. What is this strange fountain of life a refuge, a source of joy and security, and the beginning of wisdom found in that phrase, fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is Old Testament wording for something described differently in the New Testament. Following Jesus, finding his saving grace, and constantly making time and space in our lives for his presence, is the New Testament way of describing that mysterious and grand phrase, the fear of the Lord, which we find so often in the Old Testament. Trusting Christ is the Christian's version of the fear of the Lord. When you come across it in the book of Psalms or come across that admonition to fear the Lord, don't go glassy-eyed. Don't nudge the phrase aside. Think, I'm counting on Christ. He's counting on me. I put my full trust in him. So that, that ha happens, perhaps as we intentionally kind of look for opportunities for that burning bush moment where we take off our shoes, where we walk barefooted, figuratively speaking, in the presence of God. A faith encounter a stop-and-look-up moment, a surprised-by-God event, the place wherever you find it and wherever you can make it something you avail yourself to, what some people would call the thin place, the place where you cheek to God's cheek can be together. Well, we left poor Gary on a park bench his stomach in three knots of fear. One, that he would repeat his mistakes. Two, that the struggle to blend a new family would be too much for him. And three, that he maybe wasn't even worth someone else's love. Gary said that as he sat there meditating, he felt rather than heard the words, let them go. You don't need them anymore. Let them go. He opened his eyes, and as he gazed out at the calm waters, three geese toddled up to him and prodding his legs with their beaks, then seeing that he had no bread to give them, each one, one at a time, took flight over the water and into the distance. He sat and stared at them until they were mere specks on the horizon. 
And then he got up, walked to his car, filled with what I would say the Old Testament's wording would be this fear of the Lord, the fear that drives away all other fears. Or as the New Testament would put it, the faith to follow Jesus wherever the road leads. So I'll just close with this Easter morning remembrance of mine that carries me through so many, many years of Easter celebration. And that is the way Matthew describes the two Marys who go to the tomb and speak to the angel. And after hearing these words, they run to tell the disciples. And as Matthew's gospel puts it, filled with fear and awe. As I begin the second half of 2020, I think of that image. Oh, I want my life to be patterned after those two Marys, knowing that God's kairos in the resurrection of Jesus keeps reoccurring in the midst of our lives. Amen.